Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. My name is Dave Lorenzo, and this is a new beginning for the show. I'm so excited because I'm here today to introduce you to my partner in the podcast. She has been a great resource for me, a great partner for me in a project we've been working on for the past year. And that went so well, and we developed such a great friendship that I thought it would be fantastic to invite her to join me and co-host this show moving forward. So please welcome Nicola Gellarmino, but you can call her Nikki G to the Inside BS Show. Hey, Nicola, welcome. Hi, Dave. I'm so excited about this too, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Well, this is going to be a lot more fun now that you're here. So I'm really grateful that you've decided to accept my offer and join us. Tell me, we're heading into, so this show is coming out in the beginning of July. So tell me what you've got planned for the rest of the summer. You got, you got anything special going on? Special? I sure do. I have planned a seven-day stay at the Miami Courthouse for a trial <laughs> that is in September. Oh, wow. Those Fun are my immediate times. plans right now. <laughs> Fun times for you. So tell everybody who's listening and everybody who's watching just briefly, what's the level of preparation? So you now your, your trial is in September and we're in January. So you've got two months. But what will those two months be like? What will you be doing during those two months? Oh, you will be doing a lot of work. It's very intense. You're working through, you know, your strategy overall for the case. You're working through the rest of discovery, making sure you have everything that you need to be able to prove your case and that you're putting that together and making sure that you're building a great narrative. So it is very, very intense time for those of us who are trial lawyers getting ready for, you know, that week. There's so much work that goes into that week. And then that week itself is incredibly long. <laughs> Okay, well, that sounds like it's going to be a really intense experience. You know, I'll tell you, one of the things that I think has really helped us connect, I mean, you and me, and one of the things that I think can put relationships kind of on the fast track is when you're involved with something like that, like a big project or a trial or a case, and there's a significant amount of pressure, intensity, and tight deadlines. For example, in our case, for the last year, we've been working with Provisors, which is a national networking group. And you and I together built the largest group in the history of that organization, 8,500 members. Nobody had ever built a group that was over 50 members before. And you and I did it in eh, right around six months. And I think the intensity of that, the frequency of communication, constantly working on self-imposed deadlines and, you know, interviewing people and really making sure we got it right, that kind of intensity in any situation, like trial prep, for example, will put a relationship on almost fast forward and it's going to go one of two ways. It's going to go, in our case, really, really well, where you recognize the good qualities and the complementary strengths in one another, or it could go horribly wrong, where you're like, if I have to spend another day with this person, they're going to find their head in a bowling bag in the closet, right? What do you think about that? Do you think that there's something to that, the intensity of an event or a project can really escalate where a relationship might be going? Absolutely. I think that's very insightful, Dave. Some of my closest professional relationships were built by having an intense period of time together where we worked on a case, working it up for trial, or we worked in a professional organization like you and I did. It's a very similar setting in terms of what it really comes down to, the intensity, the focus, and being able to collaborate together. And so I think it's, again, it's really spot on, Dave. I agree. So that you know what that is? That there's a chemical in your brain called dopamine that is released when you're involved in an intense experience. So, and if that intense experience and I'm not, it, it's released when you're involved in like a life-threatening experience and it's also released uh, in smaller quantities into your brain during like a, a project that has numerous deadlines and like almost like a drumbeat of intensity to it. We find, by we, I mean people who are consultants, 
uh, especially if you've worked in the leadership development space or you've worked with business leaders that people who work in shifts will often bond and will often have really close relationships, because, especially people who work shifts that are off of the mainstream. Uh, they'll often have really close relationships. And a great example of that, that I, and it's a story that I tell all the time, is when I was in the hotel industry, finishing college, my last, my, my school was on trimester. So my last trimester of college, I was a bellman in a hotel which by the way is probably one of the best jobs you can ever have. It's one of the most fun jobs you'll ever you'll ever get into. And I worked a lot almost exclusively like 4 to 12, 5 to 1 in the morning and the hotel generally I worked in a big hotel with a lot of people and during the day there may be, you know, 350, 400 employees wandering around the hotel at any given time. And this is a 444 room hotel. At night, there were probably maybe 25 or 30 employees on the four to 12 shift. If there was a banquet, there'd be more wait staff. But in general, there were probably 25 or 30 employees on the four to 12 shift. After the four to 12 shift is over, if you're working that shift, your life is completely different than the rest of the world, than the general public. So you get off work at 12, that's like your five o'clock. So what you do is you go out with everybody else who works the 4 to 12 shift, and generally you go out to the same place. You go out to a place that's open until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning because you just finished work, especially if you're in your 20s, and you bond with these people. What happens during the day is you probably get up 11 or 12 o'clock in the morning, and if it's a nice day in the summer like today, you all go to the beach together, and then you drive to work together, or... You know, if it's not a beach day, but it's still good weather, maybe the guys will go play golf together or go to a baseball game if there's a day game and then you go to work together. That causes a bond. And those people, and I'm not joking that I work the 4 to 12 shift with, I am still friends with just about all of them today. Some of them are highly successful people and one in particular would not be happy with the story I'm about to tell you. So I'm a bellman in a hotel and I bond with this guy who was a banquet waiter at the time and he would later, as I moved up through the ranks in the rooms division, he moved up through the ranks in food and beverage. He's now a multi-brand general manager over in Asia. His name is Mahmoud. I'm not going to give you his last name, but he and I became really close friends. So we would go every night. We, a bunch of us, 15, 20, 25 of us would go to Pete's Saloon in Elmsford, still there. And we would eat dinner and have a couple of beers and just hang out. And this was a very safe area, very nice area. You know, not quiet, but semi-urban area, but they would have a band and it was a great place to hang out. And there were a lot of after work people who would go there, people who were shift workers. One night in particular, and I, I had just met Mahmoud. I had just gotten to know him. He was in training to be the captain of an oil tanker. And he had an arranged marriage back in Syria where his family was from. And he didn't want to be in the arranged marriage. So when his ship docked in Miami, he jumped ship and got a flight to New York, applied at the hotel, and became a banquet waiter. So he and I bond. And one night we're in Pete's. And it was late. And for some reason, it was just the two of us. And we were sitting at the bar. And the guy who was the bartender was there, and the three of us were in a conversation. And the next thing I know, a guy walks in, goes to the bathroom, and the three of us were in a heated conversation about sports or something. And when I turn around, the guy who is in the bathroom is standing next to the bartender with a gun pointed at his head. So that situation was I had never been I grew up in New York my whole life I had never been exposed to guns I had never held a gun only seen a gun like in a in a display case somewhere I had never never had any experience with it I'm a young guy and it's Mahmoud and I at the bar the bartender gun to his head just the three of us in the bar probably 3 30 in the morning right before the bartender was ready to go home You know, it's just one of those situations where you want to talk about triggering some intense emotions. Have you have you ever have you ever had any experience with guns? I mean, you grew up in you grew up in Western Pennsylvania. I'm sure that it didn't take you until you were in your mid 20s before you had seen a gun. All right. But while that's a stereotype, there there is something to be said. So growing up in Western Pennsylvania, hunting is a popular sport. 
And so when I'm younger, I'm going through the school system, we had days off. School districts would provide a day off for the first day of deer season because many children had youth hunting licenses and would go hunting with their parents. Oh, it's a stereotype, but you're getting a day off from school because of hunting season. Yeah, it's a stereotype. Okay. I did enjoy the day off. So I didn't hunt. I didn't hunt. But I did, because we had friends who did hunt, I did have the experience of shooting a rifle at a young age. And really, I, guns weren't foreign to me because I had friends and family members who served in the military. All right. Well, yeah, my father served in the military, too, but he calculated separation pay like in Brooklyn. I knew I know he handled a gun in the military, but that's a whole different thing. You know, I've done I've done five hundred and fifty three podcasts over the last seven years and one hundred and thirty one of those shows were the show under this title, uh, the Inside BS show. I can't tell you how excited I am that you're here and that we're kind of entering this new era. So I'm wondering if uh, if it would be okay if I kind of ask you a few questions so that the people who are watching, the people who are listening, maybe they can get to know you a little bit. Of course. So Western Pennsylvania, where specifically in Western Pennsylvania? Johnstown. Johnstown is a small city in western central Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half east of Pittsburgh. Hour and a half east of Pittsburgh. Okay. And what was your first job out there in Johnstown? My first job was working for the family business. So my father has a packaging distribution company that is still there today. I worked in accounting for the family business. So by 14 or 15, I was handling accounting work. And I remember when I filled out my application to go to college down here, I end up getting asked about the bullet points on my resume when I later applied to be a counselor to younger students in the School of Business. And I distinctly remember this event happening because one of the managers for the program had said, I have to ask you about this. It's a little unusual to see this on someone's resume to perform accounting work at that age. And I had, you know, Bouncing a general ledger, payroll, you name it. And so I, I felt like there might have been a little hesitation in seeing it. And I said, no, this, is, this was my job. I worked for the family business. So I was exposed to that at a young age and developed what turned out to be really good skills for business young. And was that your choice or that was just what they needed and that's why you dropped into it? It was my choice. Okay. You wanted to work with the numbers. That's really interesting. What was your undergraduate? So you're, you're an attorney now, but what was your undergraduate degree? Finance and marketing. That was a double Finance major. and marketing. Okay. All right. So you, so you really, you liked the finance part of it, huh? That was, that was interesting to you. The finance part came easy to me. So mm. to be truthful, it, it was something I was just naturally talented at, was working through math and then it became finance. So I enjoyed it. Does that inform a lot of the creditors' rights work you do now? Is that how you kind of got into doing some creditors' rights work as an attorney? Great connection. I hadn't really thought of it that way, Dave, but I do work with a lot of accountants and especially forensic accountants in the bankruptcy space. And having that understanding really helps to provide the knowledge that I need to work with those professionals when we're putting together you know, strategy in, in those cases. And so how long were you in the family business doing that? Did you have other jobs or did you work in the family business until it was time to go to college? I had other jobs as well. Oh, let's hear about that. <laughs> I worked at Radio Shack while I was in high school. I know for those of you that still recognize it, it was alive and well then. I sold batteries and prepaid cell phones. The prepaid cell phones are great because we got a little bit of extra, you know, commission on them if you sold them. (laughs) Wow. Radio Shack. Was it like Radio Shack in like the Altoona Mall? Where was the Radio Shack? (laughs) It was in a strip mall. All right. Uh, Let me ask you something. It was such a pain in the ass. Did you ever, did did anybody ever get really aggravated when they, when you asked them for their phone number? Radio Shack was the first place to ever ask people for your phone number. When I'm going in there for batteries and you need my phone number, damn it, come on now. Did anybody ever get really angry with you when they asked, when you asked for their phone number in Radio Shack? Not with me personally, but yes, people got angry. You know, I get angry when I get asked for my phone number, despite being on the other side of that. (laughs) Yeah, Radio Shack was a pioneer in pissing the customer off. That's great. (laughs) I love it. So what was your favorite job? What was your, of the early jobs, not real jobs, like your favorite, like, younger person job? My favorite was working as an intern for a commercial real estate company. 
So I worked throughout my senior year with commercial real estate firm down here in Miami, and I worked with a team that specialized in private client investments. So, you know, individual investors or groups of investors who invested in investment properties. And I love that job because it taught me two things. One, how to work hard and learn raw sales skills. You know, there we learned how to cold call, put together pitch decks. I mean, skills that really translate to any business area um, in terms of building a book of business. And they also taught us how to play hard. So we had what they called intern fun days. I love that. We had days where we just went out and we did team building and we had fun for the day and we didn't work. And so that, that was a great experience to be young and have a job where you're with people who were, you know, these were youngish guys who are you know, doing great in their profession and just really fun to hang out with. So it was great to learn from them and to enjoy spending time with them. That's terrific. And how long did you work in real estate? I ended up taking a position full time and worked for a little over three years. But there I worked on the, the tenant rep side, working with companies who were leasing office space. So between undergrad and law school, how much how much time was there? I worked for a little over three years before I went to law school. Okay. And why did you decide to go to law school? I went to law school because I really wanted to understand the legal side of the advice that I was providing. So I felt disadvantaged. So I'm providing advice to CEOs, right? Business leaders on you know, how they're selecting their office space, understanding it from a financial perspective, what it's going to cost them, making the best decision for their business. And I felt that I was disadvantaged in the sense that I couldn't provide the legal advice as to the contracts they're signing. And so I went to law school thinking, you know, I really want to understand when I'm advising businesses moving forward in any space, I want to have that understanding to be able to help them make more informed decisions by really seeing the legal side of that perspective to make the right decisions. So I go to law school thinking that I'm going to end up working back in real estate, probably on the transactional side for one of these companies doing deals. Shook my I... first, you know, class, was exposed to trial work and fell in love. So I absolutely, this is one of the qualities I absolutely love about you is that you have the need for mastery in everything. Like, so you went to law school so you could give better advice to people about the law. I give advice to people about the law every day and I have <laughs> No business going anywhere near a law school. And this is one of the qualities in you that I think makes you special, makes you unique. And that's that you have this desire for, you know, for mastery of anything that you're interested in. Now, I mean, maybe there's some subjects that you're not interested in where you would be like, yeah, that's nice, you know, great, okay. And you just kind of blow it off. I have yet to see that, <laughs> but I think you have, a, um, you have a, a unique ability in that if you're into something, you have to feel, you feel like you have to get all the way in. Is that fair? I think that's fair. And it can be exhausting on this side. I wish I didn't feel that way at times. <laughs> But it's true, if I'm really interested in it, if I'm passionate about it, I will really dig into it. And I, you're right, I, I want to have a really deep understanding of what I'm doing. And you worked at some really good firms and you did some really interesting work at those firms. What was the genesis of going out on your own? What was the, what was the reason, what was the catalyst for starting your own firm? I mean, I, you know, I can kinda, you know, looking back over your career history, as you just told us, obviously you grew up in an entrepreneurial environment, which is a huge advantage for any kid. So you knew what it was like for, you know, for a family to have someone in the family who starts a business. What was the spark that kind of led you to, you know, leave a good job in, you know, in big law? I mean, well, you, were, you weren't at uh, an AmLaw 50 firm, but you were at a good size firm. What was the spark for you to leave a big firm where there's some sense of security if you don't think about it as an entrepreneur would, what was the spark for you to, to go out on your own? For me, it was, and I think you might already know this, Dave, that I'm an entrepreneur at heart. It was always there. And I've at each point in my career where I've pivoted, and there have been a few times now, I recognize that the time was right to do it. I valued the time that I spent working with a you know prestigious firm. It, it was a great experience. I took away so many skills and worked with excellent professionals. And I felt I needed that experience to go on to the next step. And for me, that next step was 
opening a firm and continuing to do some of the work that I was doing, working with businesses out there. All right. So uh, for those of you who are listening, those of you who are watching, we're talking to Nikki G, Nicola Gellermino. She's my brand new partner on the Inside BS show here. We couldn't be happier to have her. I told the story at the beginning. I didn't forget. I'm going to get to that. I'll get back to that story in just a minute. So, Nicola, if you could give your 21-year-old self any piece of advice, what piece of advice would you give to the 21-year-old Nikki G having a great time hanging out with real estate people or whatever you were doing back then? Wow. (laughs) I would tell my 21-year-old self, Do not worry about where you are going to get. Believe in yourself and enjoy the journey. It's taken me a long time to realize that a lot of life is about the journey. It's not about being so worried about what's going to happen or what's coming next. So that's the advice I would give myself because right now I'm really enjoying the journey. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And it's great advice for you, whether you're 21 or 41 or 51 or 61. There's a lot of life left to live. You don't want to have to get hit by a cab to have to figure it out, right? So when it comes to your career, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of taking those risks. It's not easy to make those big decisions. And at several times in my career, I've done that. I've pivoted and said, I'm going to move in a completely different direction. And it takes a lot to tell yourself, you can do this and to do it. And so I really am proud of myself that I've taken those risks because for me, you know, it's, it's really paid off, but you don't know that at the time that you take them. I think that's terrific. How do you handle risk? What is your, kind of what is your, way of assessing whether a risk is worth taking or not what do you do you have a process that you go through when you when you're thinking about a risk because you're a very rational person so when you take a risk what's your process like that's a great question dave so the process i went through was i thought about this for months and i interviewed friends I sat down with a lot of friends who have done this, who have been there, who I knew would provide very candid feedback on what that process would look like to open up their own, my own firm. I took notes, I asked questions, and I was very thoughtful about, you know, what will the first 30 days look like? What will the, the first 60 days look like? 90 days. And so I mapped all of that out to know exactly what I thought I would be getting into for at least that the first few months starting to do it and what I needed to do to put the pieces in place. And so then through that process, I also weighed the risks, right? I can stay where I am or I can take this other option. And I also thought about, you know, the benefits of each and the potential risks associated with each. So how did I, this is a great, like, I can't wait to hear the answer to this question. How did your 30, 60, 90 day plan compare to what actually happened in real life? There was a lot more to do than I ever anticipated. My to-do list went from a few pages to a notebook. So there, there's always a lot more that you can't anticipate. But the bottom line is this, at least have some sense of exactly what you need to accomplish and the rest, you'll figure it out as you go. Yeah. But I I wanted to think about it first instead of leap first. (laughs) Yeah. So what was the most frustrating thing for you about doing it? And then what was the most rewarding thing so far? Because I know great things are yet to come. What was the most frustrating thing and the most rewarding thing? The most frustrating thing for me was not knowing what every month ahead of me looked like. As you can imagine, I like to know, you know, what's coming next. I'm, I'm always thinking about what's next. And so that part is a little bit scary when you don't know what those next few months look like, especially in terms of work that, you know, you're, you're looking to get and you just don't know what that looks like. You don't know what clients will work with you. You don't know what your business looks like. You don't know what to even expect from that standpoint with, you know, some idea, but you really don't. And that, that part was scary for me and frustrating. Yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. And that no matter how successful you are, there's always that you, you never know. And I think a couple of things that keep you going is eventually you become comfortable being uncomfortable and you start to learn 
about yourself and you start to learn how to manage some of those feelings. And the second thing, and the thing that in this instance, specific to what you just said, that keeps me going is how one phone call on one day can change everything in a good way for you, right? So you can pick up a phone, answer a phone call, sign up a client on a Friday afternoon, and on the Monday morning, you're off to the races with a case that you're going to bill hundreds of thousands of dollars on. That can and will happen. It can and will happen. It happens to me. I don't bill by the hour, but it happens to me all the time. And it's always when I'm going through one of the deep valleys. So I never let myself get too low. I never let myself get too high because I know that that one phone call is coming that could change everything, could change the entire trajectory of your career. One phone call, one relationship. That only happens if you're an entrepreneur. That only happens if you control your own destiny. So I understand what you're saying. And, you know, your first year is exactly the way the rest of your life is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You, you asked me a second question that I didn't answer yet. What is the most rewarding part of it? Yes. The most rewarding part of this is recognizing that the possibilities are endless. You can do so many things when you're an entrepreneur, you know, like the show. You know, this is the, at the top of my list. There's so many things that you can do at the same time and it's really it really is endless you can take the risks and enjoy it i think that's fantastic and i think i think that's exactly the attitude you should have so if you're out there now and you're considering starting your own business go for it plan it all out like nicola and then the minute you start your business you can just take that plan and put it in a drawer somewhere because like mike tyson said everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the mouth all right, Nicola, let's do something a little fun before I uh, before I go back to my story about Mahmoud and the bar and the gun. Um, I'm going to ask you three things about yourself that would make me want to get to know you better. They can't be about work. They can't be about your physical appearance. But you and I just met. Tell me three things about you that would make me want to get to know you better. Sure. Let me. I'll give you a story that talks to both points. So I've done an extensive amount of traveling. Um, it's something that I just really enjoy. And despite, you know, Aldo and I not having that much time off over the years to be able to travel, what we would do is fit in as many countries as we could in the amount of time that we had. And that could include countries in a matter, we would knock out some countries in a matter of two days. And we would hit as many as we could. At this point, I've lost count. But the stories are endless that come from these travel adventures that we've had. And so I, I do get asked often about the, the records behind me. So this one will answer a lot of the questions I get about the Beatles album. So I, I love music. So we're traveling in Europe. Um, at this point, we're in Prague. And I'm searching on the internet, looking up things that are going on to check out while we're there. And I happen to see that no other than Paul McCartney is putting on a show that evening and I said, we have to go. We have to find a way to go. So, you know, Aldo's off. He, he's a master at finding tickets, buying, buying or selling anything, really. But, I, you know, he, he was tasked with finding tickets, and he did it. So we found someone who was selling tickets. And all we had to do was make sure we met up with them at the meeting point. So Aldo finds the guy who has the tickets for us. And at this point, this is years ago, and so you know, we, we, the phones aren't working the way that they do now. Uh, Google Maps is still in its infancy in other countries, and so we knew where we needed to be at a set point in time to pick up these tickets to make the concert. So we figured out how we're going to get there. We hop in a cab. It looked like we had just about enough money with us to be able to get to the destination. Well, as we're driving along, we're realizing it's taking a lot longer than we thought. At this point, I'm starting to get anxious and I'm counting the coins in my purse, trying to figure out if we get, if we have to get out of this cab, how far is it going to be? It could have been a few miles at that point. So now I'm like, I'm really, it's, the anxiety is growing and I'm just, all I can think of is we've got to make this concert. This may be a once in a lifetime experience. So we get close enough 
We get close enough, we hop out of the cab, but at this point now we're cutting it close on time and there's no way to contact this, this person because we no longer have the Wi-Fi, you know, back at the hotel. We've got to just find this person. So we sprint to the meeting place. At this point now I'm feeling like I'm in the amazing race. <laughs> sprint to the meeting point. We find the guy just in time. We get the tickets. We get to the show and it's glorious. Paul McCartney plays for what seemed like two hours pulling from the catalog of music that the Beatles have. It was an unbelievable show and one that I'll never forget. Oh, what a great story. That's fantastic. What, what about that? What about travel? What about those adventures? What is it about that you find rewarding and fulfilling? What is the feeling about that that you get that, you know, excites you? So I, I come from humble beginnings. I grew up in a, a small town and, you know, the, the part of the story we hadn't gotten to is I watched my father sell almost every asset he had to start that business and watched that struggle from the beginning. And having had that experience, you know, I've learned to really appreciate the things that come to you in life. And for me, I never thought I would have the opportunity to see the world. I didn't. I had big dreams for myself, but I still thought, wow, to be able to travel the world is something I may never be able to experience, but I would sure love to do it. And so when I got to the point where I was able to do it, I said, I'm doing this young because I never thought I would have a shot at it. And you never know, you know how much time you have in life. And that's why we took those adventures and we saw as many countries as we could, because I kind of thought at some point, you know, this, this dream may go away and I won't be able to do this. And so to me, it's all of that. It's having to, to be able to even have that experience and then to just soak in, you know, taking, a, the, the, taking in different cultures, different countries. It's really an incredible experience. And so for me, it's something I'm passionate about and I really appreciate it. No, that's, that's terrific. And that's another reason, and I just figured this out now, another reason why we get along so well. You have a sense of urgency about that because of the way you grew up. And I have a sense of urgency about pretty much everything I do because I got hit by a freaking taxi and <laughs> didn't know what tomorrow may, may ever bring. So that's another reason why I think the two of us are connected in the way that we are. All right, so based on all of that, what advice would you give to folks who are you know, part of our community? If somebody were to say to you, all right, Nicola, what's your best piece of advice that you could give me? Let's say they're, they're another professional. Maybe they don't have to be a lawyer, but they're another professional and they're, they're in their own firm. What's, the, what's the, the top piece of advice you would give them? The top piece of advice is do not be afraid to try different things and to go outside of your comfort zone. So for me personally, the only way I've been able to grow is to be uncomfortable and to get through the point of being uncomfortable, which allows you to get to that next level. So that's my advice to you. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, so the, you know, another thing that I think is, uh, is a great connection for us, you and me, but for all the folks who are probably listening or, or maybe watching this is the intensity of the entrepreneurial experience is one that triggers that dopamine that we talked about right at the beginning. It triggers that, intense feeling that you can really become hooked on because you're chasing the next big deal or even when you're in kind of a down cycle and there's the need to bring in X amount of dollars in order to survive or to get that next big piece of equipment that you need. You know, my wife and I, uh, Carrie and I talk all the time about how the time when my business takes a leap to the next level is the time when we have the biggest plans. You want to move to a bigger house in a nicer neighborhood, all of a sudden your business increases by 30% like magic, right? You want to send your kids to private school, your business increases by 15% like magic because of the intensity that comes with the personal goal that you have and you know the feeling of chasing that goal and that's what feels so good. It's almost like, tell me if you've ever experienced this, you achieve the goal and then you achieve the goal and you're like, okay, <laughs> now what? It's not like it was the whole chase. It wasn't the actual getting to where you wanted to be. So you got to find the next thing. You ever been there? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It is, it's a blessing and a curse is what it is because you, you are constantly driven to achieve more, but at some point you have to tell yourself, right? I, I have to find fulfillment in the accomplishments. So it's not overwhelming so that you're not only worried about what's next, but you can also appreciate what you've done. So I have, I have worked it, to find that balance. And put it another way, one of the things that I've decided to do forever in moving forward is I don't want to achieve the goals. I don't want to accomplish that stuff if I'm not with people, to your point, who I can enjoy the journey with, right? I don't want to do these things if I'm not with people who are going to get the same charge out of you know, doing, the, achieving the goal or going through the process. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm 55 freaking years old and I came to that realization just a couple of years ago after like 10 years of doing fine on my own, but realizing that, you know, the risk of taking on a partner in, on a project or maybe even in a complete business the risk of that, sure, things could potentially go bad and sure, it could get messy, but the upside is so much greater because you are working with somebody with whom you can enjoy the journey. To me, that realization, I honestly believe is what will help me and any project I get involved in go to the next level. I am never doing another big project or taking on another business challenge without having a complimentary partner by my side, not only to make up for all the crap that I screw up, but also to be with me to enjoy that journey because there is no reward or the reward isn't nearly as great if it's just you running the race by yourself and you get to the finish line and there ain't nobody else there, <laughs> right? <laughs> so going back to that, the intensity of experience and the relationships that were formed every job I've ever had. I had a team and, I, you know, stupid me, entrepreneur for, for what, uh, 15, 16 years before I realized that having a team around me has always been, or people that I care about has always been what fired me up. Every job I ever had, I had people around me who we had a great time together while we were being successful, including the project that you and I worked on with at Provisors, which is the freaking volunteer job, which is, continues to be, some of the most fun I've ever had in my professional career. So to finish the story about the bond that, uh, that we had with the people on the second shift, Mahmoud and I at the bar with the guy with the gun to his head, I'm looking at this guy and my eyes are focused. They're transfixed on the gun that's at the head of the bartender in Pete's saloon. Bartender's name was Jeff. I'll never forget it. And Jeff is petrified. And the guy is robbing Jeff. And before I can turn back around to look and see what Mahmoud's reaction is, Mahmoud's got his own gun pointed at the robber. <laughs> and he tells the robber in no uncertain terms, in fact, the exact phrase he used, and he will repeat this to this day, if we have a couple of drinks, he will say, you cost me a one-way ticket back to Syria. He said, I am going to drop you where you stand, whether you shoot Jeff or not. Oh, my God. I was like, what did he just say? And the guy who was robbing the bartender was so scared, he dropped the gun <laughs> and turned around and ran. He ran right out the back door. And the guy ran out the back door. We locked the back door. We locked the front door. And after we picked Jeff up off the floor, he called the <laughs> cops. And we ended up having to, we needed to leave because Mahmoud's status in the country wasn't exactly, wow. you know, it wasn't exactly how you say legal. <laughs> <laughs> he since cleared that up. But that's the story of uh, friendships and, and a bond that can be created. And then after that, we explained the, uh, the gun laws of the state of New York to my friend, and <laughs> he, he revised his ways. But um, so that's my, that's my experience. Uh, well, one of my experiences with guns. 
Thank you so much for allowing me to ask you these questions, which were probably incredibly intrusive for you because we've been friends for a year and I found out a lot of new stuff about you that I didn't know. So I appreciate you being willing to play along with me. Thank you for the trust and thank you for agreeing to do this with us. It's been such a pleasure. And look, Dave, if I'm not okay allowing you to ask questions that are intrusive and that make me feel uncomfortable, then I wouldn't be following the steps that I'm giving advice on. You have to be uncomfortable in order to grow. And this is something I really wanted to do. And as you know, it's a bit outside my comfort zone. So I'm going to do it and it's going to be a little uncomfortable to get there. <laughs> oh, if you folks could only be with us to hear the questions I'm gonna ask her when we turn off the cameras. So, <laughs> all right, that'll do it for this episode of the Inside BS Show. I wanna thank my brand new partner, Nikki G. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Be sure and join us back here again tomorrow for another great show. Some shows are long, some shows are short, but we always give you the inside business secrets. Until tomorrow, I'm Dave Lorenzo and she's Nikki G. We'll see you back here again tomorrow, folks. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.